So we just discussed the three principles that um, I think are very important for us to keep in mind when uh, reading and understanding Freud, especially his anthropological thinking. Um, that included the biogenetic law, the complemental series, and Lamarckian evolutionary theory. And what I'd like to do now is discuss Freud and 19th century cultural evolutionism, and then begin talking about totem and taboo. And hopefully in this next section, get through uh, the first three chapters of totem and taboo, and then save the last chapter for the last uh, section of this lecture. So Freud and 19th century cultural evolutionism. More than a decade before Freud invented psychoanalysis, he had already read virtually everything by Darwin and was familiar with the leading 19th century cultural evolutionists, the most notable being Herbert Spencer. For this reason, a few words about Spencer and Darwin I think will be appropriate and helpful. Spencer was among the first to apply Darwin's theory of evolution to cultural change and Freud included Spencer's writings on religion among the standard works, quote, from which all that I have to say about animism and magic is derived, end quote. Freud's hypothesis on the origins of totemism is indebted to Spencer's view of gods as displacements from the father, and no major cultural evolutionist of Freud's time was uninfluenced by Spencer's well-known ran process theory of evolution, formulated in Progress, Its Laws and Cause, in 1857. And that was two years before Darwin's Origin of Species. Freud's recurrent references to the process of civilization, or alternately the progress of civilization, is undoubtedly heir to Spencer's universal model of evolution from physical matter to biological life, to human mind and upward to culture and societies. The idea was um, from the simple to the complex and uh, in good enlightenment um, spirit, the idea was progress. Uh, always moving from lower to higher levels of differentiation and integration. So Charles Darwin. Beyond his theory of evolution by natural selection, Darwin's own cultural anthropological positions had a profound influence on Freud. In fact, Freud considered Darwin's The Descent of Man, 1871, among the ten most important books ever written. Freud agreed with Darwin on most of his anthropological claims, including the assumption of a sexual dimension relating to sexual selection, underlying the dynamics of dynamic origins of religion, the idea that the universal incest taboo indicated an equally universal underlying um, uh, wish, incestuous wish, the primal horde as the original human social group, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit later on, Darwin's analysis of emotional expressions as emotional survivals, and then the major tenets of cultural evolutionism, which, which we'll discuss below. So Freud's estimation of totem and taboo, by far the most important of Freud's anthropological works, totem and taboo remains the centerpiece of Freud's anthropology. It essentially lays the foundations for all the major themes in Freud's subsequent works dealing with anthropological or social cultural questions. In his preface to Totem and Taboo, Freud excuse me, writes that Totem and Taboo serves to, quote, represent a first attempt on my part at applying the point of view and the findings of psychoanalysis to some unsolved problems of social psychology. Unquote. Freud acknowledges in the preface that Totem and Taboo was written in the context of a polemic, uh, 
as a methodological contrast to the psychological theories of Wilhelm Wundt, often referred to as the father of modern social psychology, and to the writings of the Zurich School of Psychoanalysis, which of course was the, um, a reference to Carl Jung, the Swiss uh, physician. Writes Freud, quote, I readily confess that it was from these two sources that I received the first stimulus for my own essays. Uh, a word on the famous split between Freud and Jung, I think, is also helpful here. It's probably true that the main influence of Jung on the writing of Totem and Taboo was the competitive impulse that his sociological investigations were stimulating in Freud. The well-known rupture between Freud and his heir apparent, Jung, crescendoed as each was exploring the relation between neurosis and mythology, subjects on which both hoped to make landmark contributions. The split occurred the very year Totem and Taboo was published. Jung had released his own declaration of theoretical independence in the form of symbols and transformations of the libido in 1912, the year earlier which against Freud explicitly minimized the role of the Oedipus complex and, and, and the role of libido in his psychoanalytic theory. The relevance of the respective theories between Freud and Jung, I think, is um, captured in Freud's confession to Ernst Jung, I mean Ernst Jones, that Freud hoped totem and taboo would force the rupture from Jung, quote, as an acid does a salt, end quote. And then he says, uh, Freud says only a few days later with some apparent uh, ambivalence about that rupture, uh, the totem and taboo would hasten, quote, hasten the break against my will. To fully appreciate the role of totem and taboo in Freud's thinking, it's helpful to keep in mind that Freud considered this first attempt of his, quote, the most daring enterprise I have ever ventured. Among other things, it represented the main theoretical arsenal for what he referred to as his major assault on the ethnology of his time. And in the final months of finishing it, he wrote to Sandra Ferenzi, quote, I am writing Totem at present with the feeling that it is my greatest, best, perhaps my last good work, end quote. This is really remarkable considering that at that time, uh, that was 13 years after Freud um, published The Interpretation of Dreams, and um, he was enjoying international fame uh, from that from that publication. In a word, Totem and Taboo presents Freud's reconstruction of mankind's primordial trauma that set into motion the origins of no less than all of culture and civilization. Namely, it lays out Freud's hypothesis of the primal horde, the murder of the primal <coughs> father, by the jealous sons of the primal horde, the first human social group. All the institutions of civilization have their origins in these events and converge around the operation of the universal Oedipus complex, which Freud defines in the opening pages as the nuclear complex of the neuroses. He says, we have arrived at the point of regarding a child's relation to his parents, dominated as it is by incestuous longings, as the nuclear complex of the neurosis. And here's Freud's description of to in Totem and Taboo of the Oedipus complex of little Hans, his fam famous five-year-old patient. Quote, he regarded his father, as he made all too clear, as the competitor for the favors of his mother, towards whom the obscure foreshadowings of his budding sexual wishes were aimed. Thus he was situated in the typical attitude of a male child towards his parents, to which we have given the name of the Oedipus Complex. Okay, so let's begin Totem and Taboo, the chapter, chapter one. 
Uh, Freud considered this first chapter the most lifeless thing he had ever written because basically he's in this chapter covering uh, much of the literature that had already been published on the universal incest taboo throughout cultures, primarily though focusing on primitive culture. Freud's own unique contribution to this, though, was his argument on, quote, the fact that it is essentially an, an infantile feature and that it reveals a striking agreement with the mental life of neurotic patients. He's not saying that an aversion to incest is um, an infantile feature. He's, he's saying that unresolved, unconscious conflicts that lead to neurotic symptoms and that are based on unresolved incestuous wishes. This is, this is what is infantile that he's referring to. Uh, totemism as a word or concept derived from observations of American Indians and their ancestral connection with the totem animals. Hence the totem pole is the, the family tree. By the 1860s, the term was popularized by Scottish attorney and ethnologist John McLennan, who defined totemic society as one of the universal stages in social evolution. So there's um, uh, cultural evolutionism and um, the construction of stage theories uh, in the evolution of society. Most of Freud's observations on totemism come from accounts of the Arunta, Australian Aborigines, in James Fraser's Totemism and Exogamy uh, that was published in 1910. Uh, he also gets this next summation of totemism from Reinach's Code of Totemism in Reinach's publication, Cults, Myths, and Religion, uh, published in French. Uh, so totemism is described. Arunta are considered to be the most primitive tribes existing. And so in that case, they represent the most archaic forms of human society. Here's the assumption of a universal line in cultural evolution and the comparative method. Totemism exists instead of more evolved religion or social institutions. The clan's totem is usually an animal, less often a plant or some other natural thing that represents the clan. Totemic marriage restrictions involve marriage classes according to clan divisions. They define the rules of the totem clans and require performance of ceremonies for the multiplication of the edible totem that is edible, you can eat it. The totem is associated with an elaborate system of beliefs about death and rebirth focused around sacred totem centers where the deceased totem spirits await to be reincarnated. A mother takes note of which totem center is nearby when she becomes pregnant, and this determines the child's totemic identity. Note that it's the relation to the totem and not actual uh, blood ties or consanguinity as, as it's referred to in anthropological terms, that determines uh, a kinship. Freud's two main arguments in this first chapter that uh, get carried into the, the rest of Totem and Taboo are that exogamous social structures of totemism, clans, fratries, subfratries, all the the structure of totemic societies exists primarily to prevent incest. That's the purpose. Um, and that the two essential taboos of totemism are first, except in sacred rituals, no one kills the totem. And second, exogamy. On penalty of death, the totemic law forbids marriage or sexual relations with any person in the same totemic clan, uh, the definition of incest. Okay. Before we get into the second chapter, uh, just to mention, on the subject of the origin of institutions, it's relevant here to say a few words about the fact that Freud's language in Totem and Taboo 
reveals the influence of Enlightenment thinkers, specifically uh, social contract Enlightenment theorists, such as Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. Some of his own descriptions of primeval events convey a rationalist element in the design of mankind's social institutions, quintessentially rationalist Enlightenment uh, concepts. The following passage is a case in point and also reflects Freud's <clears throat> view from Hobbes, his Hobbesian view of an original state of nature being a war of all against all. Here's Freud. Each of the brothers would have wished, like his father, to have all the women to himself. He's referring to the, the um, primal horde. Thus, the brothers had no alternative if they were to live together, but not perhaps until they had passed through many dangerous crises, to institute the law against incest by which they all alike renounced the women whom they desired and who they had been and who had been their chief motive for dispatching their father. You can get a sense almost as if Freud is conceptualizing primitive man uh, in some organized, rational way, sitting around formulating contracts. But to misread Freud as though he regarded totemism, or any religious system for that matter, to be the product of conscious forces springing from the rational minds of enlightened primitive men would be to ignore Freud's consistent emphasis on the unconscious. Again, this illustrates the problem that, this, that Freud's style and method of argument can pose for a correct reading of him. Freud, like Scottish philosopher David Hume, uh, who is Rousseau's contemporary, repeatedly stressed the operation of unconscious mechanisms, such as projection, in the origins of ritual and belief. Here he quotes Hume's Natural History of Religion. Quote, and this is Hume, uh, in Totem and Taboo, being quoted by Freud. There is a universal tendency among mankind to conceive all beings like themselves and to transfer to every object those qualities with which they are familiarly acquainted and of which they are intimately conscious. Freud also followed German philosopher and anthropologist Ludwig Feuerbach on the role of projection. Quote, man first of all sees his nature as outside of himself before he finds it inside himself. End quote. Likewise, if Freud considered dreams to be the royal road to the unconscious, he also agreed with Feuerbach that dreams could lead to an understanding of religion. Feuerbach here, quote, religion is the dream of waking consciousness. Dreaming is the key to the mysteries of religion. Uh, nor would Friedrich Nietzsche, arguably Freud's favorite philosopher, have considered primitive totemism to be the simple product of rationally drawn social contracts. Nietzsche's critical formulations on the role of sublimation and repression underscored the non-rational and unconscious nature of much of religious belief. Freud's concept of the return of the repressed is remarkably similar to Nietzsche's eternal return of the same. And Nietzsche's own view that dreams represented the survival of primitive thinking underscored the role of unconscious and irrational forces operating universally. This shows up immediately following the passage I had quoted earlier from the interpretation of dreams. Freud continues from that passage saying, quote, we can guess how much to the point is Nietzsche's assertion that in dreams, Quote, here's Nietzsche, some primeval relic of humanity is at work, which we can now scarcely reach any longer by a direct path. End quote, Nietzsche, and then here's Freud. And we may expect that the analysis of dreams will lead us to a knowledge of man's archaic heritage. So you can see how Freud's uh, use of Enlightenment concepts and the language of the Enlightenment thinkers, the social contract thinkers, uh, 
gets integrated into his theory. But um, he by no means conceptualizes the uh, origins of institutions on um, uh, a rational basis, or the origins of them being constructed on a rational basis in any simple sense. Okay, so chapter two. Taboo and emotional ambivalence. Freud asserts that unconscious ambivalence operates similarly in totemic taboos and psychoneuroses. The objects around which these systems are organized, such as the animal totem or the horse and the phobia of little Hans, I would have liked to have gone into a discussion of little Hans a little bit more, but there just wasn't enough time. Uh, that the objects around these systems are organized um, uh, let me start over the objects around which these systems are organized share the capacity to tempt or excite this ambivalence this is uh, again Freud asserting that unconscious ambivalence operates similarly in both totemic taboos and neurotic symptoms it's also worth noting that this uh, concept of Freud's, this observation that uh, ambivalence operates similarly in neurotic symptoms and in the relations between um, people and the totem, or likewise individuals of a society and the leader. This is, this is an important concept that anthropology takes up. Uh, with very little controversy, uh, unlike Freud's claims for the universal uh, Oedipus complex. Uh, this is a concept, the idea of ambivalence in social structure, social relationships, that becomes very important in 20th century anthropology uh, due to Freud. So Freud defines ambivalence. Quote, in almost every case where there is an intense emotional attachment to a person, a particular person, we find that behind the tender love there is a concealed hostility in the unconscious. This is the classical example of the prototype of the ambivalence of human emotions. Then Freud goes on to summarize the characteristic features of taboo, which include These are the form taboo can show up in the form of the sacred or unclean character of a person or things, the kind of prohibition which results from that character, and then the sanctity or the uncleanness also, which results from a violation of the prohibition. The opposite of taboo is what is common or general. So Freud here describes the various manifestations of this strange force of taboo. Quote, this power is attached to all special individuals, such as kings, priests, or newborn babies, to all exceptional states, such as the physical states of menstruation, puberty, or birth, and to all uncanny things, such as sickness and death, and what is associated with them through their power of infection or contagion. Taboo restrictions are uniquely intense and elaborate in primitive society where animistic beliefs in ghosts and spirits predominate. Although punishments associated with a taboo violation may be imposed by external agents, it is likely, Freud agrees, that the most archaic form of taboo is experienced as an inner demand, the punishment for the violation of which is automatic, immediate and intense, as though the taboo itself is doing the punishing. Freud illustrates this, quote, an, an innocent wrongdoer who may, for instance, have eaten a forbidden animal, falls into a deep depression, anticipates death, and then dies in bitter earnest. These prohibitions are mainly directed against liberty of enjoyment and against freedom of movement and communication. <coughs> 
end quote. So the mysterious power of taboo has the quality of transmissibility, like an electrical charge that can be displaced from one object to another. And like electrical current, it has quantity, a power which is proportional to the potential differences in charge between two objects, in the sociological sense, status, as between a chief and a common tribesman. It also tends to operate most especially through contact, like a contagious infection, though the act of speech is also an effective conduit. This is helpful, I think, for us to go into because uh, the similarity between his description of the, the taboo, the transmissibility, the, uh, the capacity of the charge of taboo to be displaced from one object to another, it, it all plays an important role in his exposition of his instinct theory. And uh, it really is his description of it and his explication of it uh, becomes important in how he describes instincts themselves. As particularly his instinct theory, where instinct has uh, a source, an aim, and an object, the object of which is the most um, variable of the three. It can be the, the instinct can be displaced from one object to another, just like taboo can be transmissible between and displaced between objects. Primitive, primitive taboos bear some relation to the moral imperatives of civilized society and can shed light on their evolutionary origins. Freud analyzes once popular theory that taboos derive from the animistic fear of evil demons and shows how this ignores the underlying projection of unconscious ambivalence that operates in taboo. Similarities exist between taboo ceremonies and the typical rituals of obsessional neurosis. Psychoanalytic evidence shows that neurotic symptoms serve to control unconscious ambivalence, love and hate, directed toward an object of one's developmental past. Similarly, the internalized social prohibitions of taboos suggest their analogous origins in mankind's evolutionary past and serve equally to control unconscious ambivalent desires that originated there. So Freud asks, what is the common dangerous attribute shared by the objects toward which primitives and neurotics feel such ambivalence? His answer is that it's the very capacity to stimulate the, ambival and the ambivalence. In his words, quote, there is only one thing that it can be, the quality of exciting men's ambivalence and tempting them to transgress the prohibition, end quote. Or in other words, the magical power that is attributed ta to taboo is based on the capacity for arousing temptation, end quote. He continues with an example of elaborate taboo restrictions surrounding contact with the dead. Let us suppose that the emotional life of primitive peoples is characterized by an amount of ambivalence as great as that which we are led by the findings of psychoanalysis to attribute to obsessional patients. We find that the taboo has grown up on the basis of an ambivalent emotional attitude. The taboo upon the dead arises, like the others, from the contrast between conscious pain and unconscious satisfaction over the death that has occurred. Since such is the origin of the ghost's resentment, it follows naturally that the survivors who have the most to fear will be those who were formerly its nearest and dearest." End quote. Okay. Now for a discussion of chapter three, animism, magic, and the omnipotence of thought, uh, 
It will be helpful to discuss Edward Tyler and James Frazier and the major tenets of 19th century cultural evolutionism that Freud embraced. Uh, in part because in this next chapter Freud introduces his own stage theory of evolution. Freud drew heavily from two of the most important anthropological texts of his time, Tyler's Primitive Culture and Frazier's uh, Totemism and Exogamy. In Primitive Culture, Tyler reintroduced the concept of animism into the scientific study of primitive religion and mythology, and his theory of animism was central to Freud's concept of spiritual beliefs as projective systems. In addition to totemism and exogamy, James Frazier's encyclopedic The Golden Bough provided a comparative survey of magical religious beliefs and practices throughout the world. Frazier's ethnographic accounts served as Freud's principal anthropological source. About 50% of Freud's anthropological data uh, were drawn from Frazier's accounts. Freud also agreed with Frazier's view that totemic taboo restrictions indicate a powerful underlying wish. This is integral, of course, to Freud's psychological theory in general and in particular to his argument for the universality of unconscious incestuous feelings. Here he quotes Frazier. The law only forbids men to do what their instincts incline them to do. Instead of assuming, therefore, that there is a natural aversion to incest, we ought rather to assume that there is a natural instinct in favor of it, and that if the law represses it, as it represses other natural instincts, it does so because civilized men have come to the conclusion that the satisfaction of these natural instincts is detrimental to the general interests of society." End quote. That's Freud in Totem and Taboo quoting James Frazier, one of the most important anthropologists and cultural evolutionists of the 19th century. Both Tyler and Frazier epitomized the comparative method of 19th century anthropology, and each formulated stage theories of cultural evolution according to which societies could be ranked on the scale of how evolved they are. This is the comparative method. Freud would fully embrace this so-called comparative method of cultural evolutionism and never abandon it even when it fell out of favor especially within American anthropology during the first half of the 20th century. Tyler, a founding father of British social anthropology, defined the cultural evolutionary agenda for anthropology during the latter half of the 19th century, perhaps more than, than anyone. Uh, and this agenda that Tyler was significant in defining for anthropology, British social anthropology, included the doctrine of the, of the psychic unity of man, that throughout all cultures, humans develop and intellectually their development is, um, is, is similar. That is the basic fundamental psychological equipment of all human beings, regardless of cultural differences, is, is similar. The equation of contemporary primitive society with primeval man, the idea that cultural evolution proceeds in a unilinear sequence of stages from the simple to the complex, so-called uniformitarianism, uh, the doctrine of survivals, for example, the linguistic survivals of animistic belief in souls being um, showing up in the way we refer to being besides one, beside oneself in our language or coming back to oneself. And then uh, the comparative method, method. So those are the uh, five major tenets of cultural evolutionism as it existed in the 19th century. And 
was revived actually and has has um, been revived in the second half of the 20th century after falling uh, out of favor and being largely criticized within American Boazian anthropology. Okay, so chapter three, Animism, Magic, and the Omnipotence of Thoughts. Now in this chapter, Freud proves himself to be a perfectly good cognitive theorist. He analyzes the nature of thinking in primitive animism and shows that essential to both animism and the obsessional neuroses is the operation of a peculiar underlying cognitive principle, the omnipotence of thought. Freud considered animism to be a complete system of thought, which represented mankind's most archaic theory of the universe. <coughs> With philosophers Hume and Feuerbach, he also agreed that animistic belief in spirits, demons, and transmigrating souls derived from projection of unconscious emotional impulses onto the external natural world. Externalized perceptions of primitive psychology, therefore, represented a philosophy of nature, no less than the assumptions of modern science. And in this sense, they were um, mankind's first theoretical achievements. Freud describes this world view of humanity's first philosophers. This is, this is um, how he is describing the, the world view of primitive society from the point of view of focusing on the um, the um, the intellectual philosophical uh, assumptions of animism. Quote, they people the world with innumerable spiritual beings, both benevolent and malignant. And these spirits and demons they regard as the causes of natural phenomena. And they believe that not only animals and plants, but all the inanimate objects in the world are animated by them. A third and perhaps the most important article of this primitive philosophy of nature strikes us as less strange. For primitive peoples believe that human individuals are inhabited by similar spirits. These souls which live in human beings can leave their habitations and migrate into other human beings. They are the vehicle of mental activities and are to a certain extent independent of their bodies. So the psychoanalysis of obsessional patients, for example, the rat man, suggests a unified explanation of animism and neurosis. Both are characterized by the, quote, domination of the association of ideas, end quote. Neurosis preserves this mode of thinking as a survival of an archaic confusion of similarities with identities and of thoughts with external reality. Here Freud turns to Tyler and Frazier on the nature of this magical mode of thinking. The aptness of Tyler's description, and this is Freud, quote, the, ap the aptness of Tyler's description of magic now becomes evident. Mistaking an ideal connection for a real one. Frazier has put it almost in the same words, and he quotes Frazier, Men mistook the order of their ideas for the order of nature, and hence imagined that the control which they have, or seem to have, over their thoughts permitted them to exercise a corresponding control over things." End quote. Uh, by the way, I did a, uh, a pep web search for the phrase magical thinking, you know, so widely used in our, in our field um, to refer to this mode of thinking, which we would consider symptomatic in reference to normal uh, functioning, but typical in terms of you know, phrases like knock on wood, and also typical, of course, of the dreaming state. But I did a pep web to see when I could find the first reference in psychoanalytic uh, literature to the actual phrase magical thinking as a concept. Um, 
as a, as a term of art, so to speak, if you will. And it wasn't until um, let's see, I couldn't find the use by Freud at all of the popular term magical thinking. Uh, and in a pep search for the first reference to the phrase, uh, I found the reference going back to 1930, the first one, um, in Feigenbaum and, and Jalif, if I'm pronouncing their names right, from the 11th International Psychoanalytic Congress. It was interesting. So Freud then analyzes the similarity between magical thinking and the obsessional nature of neurosis. Quote, Thus, the omnipotence of thoughts, the overvaluation of mental processes as compared with reality, is seen to have un unrestricted play in the emotional life of neurotic patients. Neurotic symptoms are of an entirely magical character. If they are not charms, they are at all events counter charms, designed to ward off the expectations of disaster with which neurosis usually starts." End quote. Okay. Now, Freud's evolutionary scheme. These observations concerning the domination of the association of ideas will play a central role in Freud's important work on narcissism in 1914, a year after Totem and Taboo. The omnipotence of thoughts, common among primitives and neurotics, bears all the earmarks of a narcissistic phase in the development of libidinal attachment. Libido remains invested or overinvested in the self, and the pleasure principle dominates. So in Totem and Taboo, Freud introduces his own evolutionary stage theory, in which the libidinal phases of individual development that he uh, defined initially in three essays on the theory of sexuality in 1905 are correlated with the vicissitudes of the omnipotence of thought and the predominant worldview or philosophy of nature for a given evolutionary stage of culture. Now this, by the way, exemplifies Freud's use of the comparative method of cultural evolutionism. Uh, Freud's methodological use of analogy and Freud's faith in the biogenetic idea of recapitulation. I don't want to belabor this chart too much, but I did want to include it to give a sense for Freud's own evolutionary scheme, where you can see he, he draws an analogy um, between the libidinal phases of development from narcissism to to object choice, child object choice, and then mature object choice. Uh, he draws an analogy between that, that developmental uh, line, if you will, um, to, as analog to the phases of development of social cultural evolution uh, from the original magic or animistic phase of cultural evolution, which he uh, associates with primary narcissism. And narcissism proper. Then the religious phase he associates with the child object choice, libidinal object choice, uh, where the attachment is to the parents. Um, and then the libidinal phase of mature object choice he associates with the scientific phase of, of cultural evolution. And then these are correlated with uh, a, a change in the locus of omnipotence, where in the early, nar early narcissism, omnipotence is still invested in the self, and then gradually to, to spirits, and then 
at a, a time uh, analogous to the religious phase of evolution when object choice in childhood is primarily directed toward parents, the locus of omnipotence shifts from self to gods, uh, equivalent to the parents in the libidinal phase of child object choice. And then finally, he equates the scientific phase of cultural evolution to the libidinal phase of mature object choice. And at that phase, the locus of omnipotence is dissipated and it shows up in what he refers to as um, recognition of the necessities of reality. And um, uh, omnipotence is showing up then also in the uh, the, the power of the human mind, belief in the power of the human mind and the natural laws. And just a final note on this, uh, this uh, third chapter. Freud also differentiates psychic and historical reality in the origin and symptoms of neurosis. This is Freud, quote, neurotics live in a world apart Agreement with external reality is a matter of no importance. What hysterics repeat in their attacks and fix by means of their symptoms are experiences which have occurred in that form only in their imagination. Though it is true that in the last resort, those imagined experiences go back to actual events or are based upon them. Note that this quote is a perfect example of Freud's style of writing in absolute terms. Here he's referred to as um, for neurotics, agreement with external reality is a matter of no, impor no importance. And his method of reasoning by weighing out both sides of a polarity as with the complemental series. This particular tension between psychic and historical reality here and the relation of a neurosis to childhood history will reemerge in the relation of totemism actually to all of civilization to its evolutionary origins in the final chapter. This nuanced interplay of psychic versus historical reality is often missed in arguments having to do with Freud's anthropological claims. I bring it up because it's going to show up in the last chapter in an important way. Uh, and so we'll get into that in the next section. Okay.